Good morning, everyone. And welcome to the ninth annual Environmental Justice Conference, Building a Clean Air Future Together. My name is Leticia Juarez, and I will be your MC for today's program, and I am delighted to welcome you here to the Riverside Convention Center. Now, for those who couldn't be here in person, we are pleased to be streaming live through Whova, YouTube, and Facebook. But before we start, um, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a journalist with ABC7. I'm the Inland Empire reporter, so I cover both San Bernardino and Riverside County. I was raised here in Southern California, specifically in San Bernardino. I attended and graduated from UCLA, and I'm very excited to be here with you uh, today because my work really deeply resonates with struggles and challenges surrounding our env environmental justice communities. Often, my work covers the important issues of air pollution, wildfires, and other critical environmental concerns. So today, I'm joining not just as a journalist, but as an ally and facilitate discussions um, on and action in support of environmental justice. No, so for, before we begin today's conference, though, today, I have some housekeeping remarks for you. For those of you here in person with us at the Riverside Convention Center, please take a moment to silence your cell phones. I had to because my dad likes to call me in the middle of Quake, we all know what to do, shelter in place, <laughs> okay? And for those streaming with us via Whova, you can join our Zoom session via the link in the app. Now we have a translator ready to translate in real time as well. Our YouTube, on YouTube that is, please click on the closed caption box on the bottom of the screen and then click the setting button. And it's a picture of a gear if you don't know what that looks like. Um, then click on subtitles and then hit Spanish. And finally, on Facebook Live, please click the gear icon, click closed caption, and select on. Please note that this conference is being recorded. My, by participating here in the ninth annual Environmental Justice Conference hosted by South Coast AQMD, you've agreed to authorize recording of audio and visual content presented during this live event and consent to subsequent use of this recording in the public domain by South Coast AQMD. Now, if you haven't done so already, please down Whova on your smartphone or tablet to, ac to access today's agenda, speaker biographies, and other important information. Now, you can download the Whova mobile app through the App Store or Google Play. Whova is, also has a virtual information desk located in the agenda tab if you have any questions or require assistance during the conference. Now, at, at AQ, South Coast AQMD staff members will assist you via virtual information desk. Now, we ask you for your patience as they can only help one person at a time. If you're joining us here in Riverside, please feel free to ask any of our South Coast AQMD staff in blue shirts for assistance. We appreciate your patience as we navigate this hybrid, hybrid format today. And most importantly, we want to thank you for taking the time to join us here today. We have an exciting program for you, including leaders from community-based organizations, federal, state, and local governments, and more. Now, it is my pleasure to welcome Lila Soto, a junior from La Sierra High School here in Riverside. Lila has been involved in the California Cadet Corps for three years and as a junior was elected as battalion commander of the La Sierra Cadet Corps program an honor usually awarded to a senior. Now she is a high achieving scholar member of the cadet drill team and color guard and hopes one day to become an anesthesiologist. So please help me welcome Lila Soto to the stage and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand as we do our Pledge of Allegiance. Place our right hand over our heart Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, 
with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lila. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Pamela at City. Pamela is a Tribal Air Program Manager for the Morongo Band of Mission Indians Environmental Protection Department. Today, she will be giving us a traditional land acknowledgement. This act allows us to reflect on the past, understand our present, and pledge our commitment towards a future that respects and protects all of our relations. Please welcome Pamela Asite. Pamela at City. Yat e she Pamela at City Yenisha, Kia Ani and Schlet, Glass Chief Pahashi, Tompahi Dishiche, Bitani Dishinali. Good morning, everyone. My name is Pamela at City. I'm a member of the, the Navajo Nation. I work for the Moronga Band of Mission Indians Environmental Protection Department. Um, as, their, as their tribal air program manager, um, and also represent the tribe as a represent the tribe as a member of the South Coast AQMD's uh, environmental justice environmental justice advisory group. South Coast AQMD acknowledges that today's event is hosted on the traditional lands shared by the Kawia, Serrano, Tongva, and Lusenya people. It is a privilege to live and work in this beautiful area. We are grateful to you, the original and and current stewards of this land. We honor and respect the many and diverse indigenous peoples still connected to their ancestral lands here in the Riverside, who preserve cultural resilience, treaty rights, and tribal sovereignty. South Coast AQMD understands that this land holds great significance for the original caretakers and pledges equal protection and from air pollution and fair access to the decision-making process that works to improve air quality for all, and that includes tribal communities. Ahiehe, thank you for your time. Thank you, Pamela, for that powerful acknowledgement. Now it is my pleasure to introduce South Coast AQMD Governing Board Chair, Vanessa Delgado, a former California State Senator. Senator Delgado is a trailblazer in environmental policy making history as the first Latina chair of the South Coast AQMD Governing Board in its 47 years of existence. Her journey with South Coast AQMD began in 2019, that is May of 2019, when she was appointed as the Senate Rules Committee's representative. Born and raised in Los Angeles, Chair Delgado is the daughter of Mexican immigrants and attended public schools in Boyle Heights and graduated from Westbridge High School in Pasadena. She received her undergraduate degree from Stanford University and completed a Master of Public Administration at University of Southern California as a Dean's Fellow. As chair of the board, Senator Delgado has outlined three key priorities aimed at advancing the, agenda, the agency's mission of cleaner air and healthier communities. Her first objective is to modernize the permitting process including streamlining the application process while maintaining transparency. Second, increasing outreach in all the communities South Coast AQMD serves to provide direct access to the agency and to hear from those most affected by air pollution. Lastly, Chair Delgado is at the forefront of leading and supporting efforts to safeguard our region's overburdened communities and ensure there are no, not, there are not neglect, they are not neglected in the transition to zero emissions. Chair Delgado is committed to building a clean air future for all. And thank you for joining us today, Chair Delgado. Thank you, Leticia. Well, good morning, everybody. Still needing some coffee. Yeah, I, I, I feel the same way, but I'm excited to be here with you today um, and welcome to South Coast AQMD's ninth annual Environmental Justice Conference. This conference is particularly important to me as a native Angelino. I grew up in Boyle Heights, breathing unhealthy air alongside my family and neighbors. I have experienced firsthand how my family's health and quality of life um, has been affected. And as a mother, I am even now more aware of how we must fight to ensure an equitable, clean air future for our children and families. 
As the chair of South Coast AQMD, my goal is to help clean the air and reduce the amount of air pollution and toxins in our communities. This, this region of Riverside, San Bernardino, Orange, and Los Angeles is the home to 17 million people. Our region represents almost half of California's population, and it includes nearly two thirds of the state's environmental justice communities. We, re we largely represent communities of color, people who look like me, and we are breathing some of the worst air quality in the nation. The largest source of pollution in our region stems from the goods movement, starting at the ports and intersecting throughout our communities on a network of highways, rail lines, warehouses, and intermodal facilities. This system culminates in a sea of warehouses and intermodal facilities in the Inland Empire, with air quality impacts reaching all the way into Coachella Valley. The heavy duty trucks, ships, trains, aircrafts, and equipment that keeps our nation's, nation's supply chain moving are directly impacting our health. All levels of government must work together to address these sources of air pollution. South Coast AQMD is working um, to address local sources of air pollution in the near, near neighborhoods that create cumulative burdens on all of our communities. California's landmark AB 617 Community Air Protection Program is helping to uplift communities to implement air monitoring and emission reduction uh, plans. South Coast AQMD serves six AB 617 communities more than any other air district in the state, yet there are many more seeking to participate. Our challenge to expanding this critical program is funding. The state has essentially not increased the funding for this program in the last four years, even though the number of communities statewide has increased. This program needs to be fully funded with an annual increase so we can continue supporting our most burdened communities in this wonderful program. South Coast AQMD will continue to work in support of these community-led efforts to reduce emissions from oil and gas operations, uh, refineries, rendering facilities and other sources. The challenge before us, how to expand and incorporate the lessons learned through AB 6117 to unburden all of our most impacted communities. Which brings us to why we are here today. This is an opportunity for everyone, including all levels of government to listen, learn and collaborate for healthy air. We all want healthy air a better quality of life, and to benefit directly from a green economy and jobs. Thank you again to all of you for being here to support um, clean air and public health. Now, it is my sincere pleasure to introduce our featured speaker, Dr. Jalone White Newsom. Senior Director for Environmental Justice for the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Under her leadership, the environmental justice team continues to work hard to deliver on President Biden's ambitious environmental justice agenda, including implementing the Environmental Justice Executive Order, releasing the first ever Environmental Justice Scorecard, advancing the Justice 40 Initiative, and launching the White House Campaign for Environmental Justice. All right, and I will join you here, Dr. Uh, Newsom. Thank you again, Dr. White Newsom, uh, for being with us today. I, I understand it was a bit of a journey this morning to get here. We appreciate you. And I am excited to discuss uh, this transformational initiative uh, the administration is implementing to break down barriers and build an equitable future for our, our environmental justice communities. So thank you for being here. Awesome, thank you, Chair Delgado. Good morning, everybody. Oh, you can do better than that, good morning. We are blessed to be here in the land of the living. So don't take that for granted. So thank you. Chair Delgado, for your leadership. Thank you for the invitation to be here. And despite the traffic that I faced yesterday, I still have a soft spot, 
soft spot in my heart for this region. So appreciate the opportunity for conversation. Thank you. You did get a better hello than I got. I feel I feel sad about mine. It's just because I'm a visitor. I, uh, I know they look. All right. Okay. So the administration is focused on putting environmental justice at the center of its actions to address disproportionate health, environmental, and economic impacts. These actions resonate for South Coast AQMD because our communities are breathing some of the worst air pollution in the nation. Can you share with us how the environmental justice executive order has set public policy stage for to remove those barriers and build opportunities for our overburdened communities? Sure. So appreciate the question. And just so everybody knows, back in April, President Biden signed uh, Executive Order 14096, revitalizing our nation's commitment to environmental justice for all, not just one person, for all. Thank you. And so, again, this EO builds on the strong foundation of the Clinton era executive order in 1994. But what is so exciting is that there are a bunch of firsts going on in this executive order. The first first that I'll talk about is that it actually provides a definition of environmental justice for the federal government, which is important because if you're trying to advance environmental justice, you have to know what it is. So this is the first definition that our federal government, again, is embracing all of our federal agencies, which is important. The second piece that I'll raise up is that it actually, again, creates an office within the Council on Environmental Quality, which is a first to make sure that environmental justice doesn't go away as the political tides might change, but it's something that is gonna be institutionalized across the executive office of the president, as well as across our federal agencies. So when you think about those two big firsts and all of the other pieces of the executive order, when you talk about the opportunity to remove barriers, I think about that in maybe three different categories. There's a lot of them, but I'll, I'll name three. So I think about removing the barriers to access, removing the barriers of accountability, and removing the barriers to really getting at good science. And so I'll speak very briefly to those. So when we talk about access, often what I hear is that a lot of folks cannot you know, connect with the White House. They can't connect with our federal agency partners that are making these critical decisions. And part of this executive order is trying to remove that barrier. We have two bodies, the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, which is called the WEJAC, which again, we are so happy to have 24 presidentially appointed leaders, EJ leaders across the country serving on this body. Three of those folks are from this region, Angelo Mia and Dr. Rachel Morella Frosch. So I wanna give them a big shout out because the WEJAC has helped really guide us in how we try and implement this ambitious environmental justice agenda. So that is a body of community leaders that are helping lead us. The second body is the White House Environmental Justice Interagency Council, the IAC. We got a lot of acronyms, but basically the IAC is a group of our federal agency partners that are committed to advancing environmental justice, that are working, work, working together, learning together in a community of practice. So those two bodies, as a part of this executive order, have to host a public meeting. And that means that anybody has access to both White House folks that can drive our decisions, as well as our agencies that are making these decisions. So that is one way this EO is removing the barrier to access. But then accountability. Just want to talk about, like, that is huge for me. And when you mentioned, again, we put out the first uh, first ever environmental justice scorecard for the federal government, which basically gives us a baseline assessment of what our agencies are doing to advance environmental justice in many ways. But, you know, also when you think about our federal agencies, they have to create strategic plans. They have to really figure out what are they going to do to address civil rights? What are they going to do to make sure Justice 40 is a real thing? And so there's always a lot of planning that happens. But what's cool about this executive order that these plans will have to be evaluated. And we are the body that's going to evaluate all of these strategic plans from the agencies. And these plans will be made public. So again, that is a level of accountability that was not in the last executive order. And last but not least, when we talk about removing barriers to science, you know, again, as you stated, we're in a region where air quality is, is it's, it's not where it needs to be. 
And so when you think about the science that you need to make sure that you are addressing all the cumulative burdens in an area, this executive order has put forth a subcommittee to actually say, okay, we need to look at the data gaps. We need to make sure the analysis that folks are using takes into account all the different burdens that communities experience because none of us experience our lives in a silo or in a bubble. So those are just a couple of ways that this EO is removing barriers so we can actually take hold of that opportunity. That sounds really promising. And um, just personally knowing that environmental justice is, is defined. I know that doesn't sound like a groundbreaking movement, but just defining a concept like that at the federal level means that hopefully it will translate to one, just you know, monitoring that data and then funding hopefully. But that's exciting. Thank you for all that hard work. And, and it is promising to hear um, all, all those changes. Um, so how do we um, ensure that equitable access to both technical and financial resources to assist our communities address air quality, climate, and workforce training? Um, how do we keep environmental justice at the forefront uh, and not, not an afterthought? Yeah, I mean, I think most of you all maybe will agree in this room that we cannot afford to have environmental justice be an afterthought. Um, I have personally been a part of many different sectors where I've seen bad policy, <laughs> bad practice, and bad, uh, you know, just process make things harder for people, make life harder, even if it intended to be a good thing. So we cannot afford in this day and age to make environmental justice an afterthought. And part of the role of CEQ is to do just that. Um, how many of y'all know what CEQ is? See, I get that kind of reception. I, so I'm a, I'm a raise back my up. hand. Yeah, yeah that, that's all right. So the Council on Environmental Quality uh, is within the executive office of the president. We are not an agency. We do not give away money. We don't do enforcement or regulations. But what we do and what I always say is our superpower is that we have the ability to convene. We are the ones that have to drive the president's agenda, and we have an opportunity to influence and guide our federal agency partners. And we have the platform of the president. So how we use that is really making sure that everything we do, everything that we talk to our agencies about, we convene our agencies, that they are putting environmental justice in the center. So what that really looks like, so I can make it plain, when you talk about notice of funding opportunities, what we call no foe, so when agencies are sending out something to say, hey, we have this grant opportunity, yada, 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 you could look back and see that environmental justice probably wasn't a part of that announcement, that our Justice 40 initiative, which is targeting, again, communities with multiple concerns that have been overlooked and left out and underinvested in, again, Justice 40 is now being a part of those announcements. So part of our accountability is making sure that our agencies are making environmental justice a part of the way they do their work. So that's just one example. I think also, again, when you think about um, making sure that there is access, um, just, you know, you know, having opportunities, technical assistance like never before. So our agencies are now realizing that part of those barriers is really folks understanding this mystical process of how to access monies, both communities as well as states, making sure that folks have the proper technical assistance to understand that process, and then making sure that there is some success after that. So Again, if we don't keep environmental justice central to all that, if we don't keep people central to that, and remember why we're doing this, then we will have this moment in time and not be able to look back and say, hey, we actually made a difference and we advanced towards environmental justice. I love that you're you're really looking at it to be long lasting and it's not about uh, you know a timeline. Um, for, for when you all are in office. So, I, and, and there's so much that I could um, ask you and, and, you know, things that we could share with the group, but is there at least one piece of advice or some inspiration that you would like to leave with our attendees today about your work or what you see at the White House? So I, I would just say, um, my goodness. So this is, I would say, the first administration where environmental justice has seriously been made a priority in so many different ways. And we can't take that for granted. Um, knowing that every moment is important and taking advantage of that is critical. The one piece that I want to leave you with, and I, and I think what I've witnessed in this room, is the power of partnership. 
We as the federal government, and I will tell everybody, we cannot do it on our own. We need each of you in this room, in the sectors you represent, to hold us accountable, you know, keep working hard, tell us what we're doing right, tell us what we're doing wrong. So, so we need you. And a part of that partnership, particularly when you talk about government partnerships with community, I think it's important to understand that there have been, <laughs> there's sometimes some healing that needs to take place. So oftentimes that trust has been broken. And so if we're going to do this together in the right way, we have to make sure that we acknowledge as government officials, the hurt and harms of the past to the communities that we've tried to help and maybe have not done it in the right way. So we can then acknowledge, deal with that and try and move forward. So to me, all of this is about sincere partnership, but also relationship building, because we have to be in this for the long run. So I would just say that I'm inspired by each of you being in this room. And I hope that if I can challenge you in one way, meet somebody you don't know, figure out a way that you're going to work with them. And then you let me know what comes out of that relationship that you're building right here and right now. So that's what gives me inspiration. I love that. Um, and, and I think it's important to that you acknowledge that that the federal government has to do some healing. And I feel that way about AQMD a lot of times, too, that uh, it's all part of it as we enter into this journey and try to make a difference, that we acknowledge the past and try to do better. So I appreciate that. And, and, and I'd really appreciate you being here um, for coming all this way and your leadership. Um, so I don't take it lightly that we have somebody here from the White House directly participating with us. Your work to build the initiatives and programs that uplift all communities to create uh, equitable clean air is very inspiring. And I look forward to continuing uh, this work with you um, and get things done. And uh, she will be here with us today um, to continue to participate. So she did talk about partnerships. So I encourage you all to take her on to her challenge and come up and talk about ideas that you have in your community. Um, and the same with me, please hold me accountable for um, the goals that we need to implement. Now. I'll turn it back uh, to our MC, Leticia Juarez. Thank you so much for getting us through the rest of the program. Well, thank you, ladies, both so very much. Uh, thank you, Chair Delgado and Dr. White Newsom for being here today for that enlightening enlightening and discussion. Now, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Riverside Convention Center staff for making this a great experience for everyone here today. We truly appreciate all your hard work that you're doing out there. We will now transition into our breakout sessions between a host of engaging speakers and discussions. So the breakout sessions include empowering overburdened communities, bridging the resource gap for environmental justice, and unlocking green opportunities, job training and education for environmental equality. For those joining us online, select the breakout session that you would like to attend by clicking show agenda. You will then be able to scroll through the two breakout sessions and select your desired panel. For those attending in person, South Coast AQMD staff members in blue shirts are available to guide you to the designated breakout rooms. But first, we'll take a short break to give everyone a chance to help themselves to some of those refreshments on the table or stretch before the breakout session, which begins at 10.50, so in about 10 minutes. Afterwards, I will see you back here in this room at 11.50 for lunch and our powerful plenary session. So enjoy your breakout sessions. Hello, my name is Fernando. I go to Uso Martinez Elementary School, and what makes me a clean air hero is by recycling. Hi, my name is Edgar. I go to Uso Martinez Elementary School, and what makes me a clean air hero is when, when I'm finished eating whatever I ate, I always pick up the wrap, I pick up after myself and put it in the trash. 
Hello, my name is Cesar. I'm a student at San Martinez Elementary School. And what makes me a clean air hero is recycling. Hi, my name is Emiliano. I go to Las Palmitas Elementary. And what makes me a clean air hero is that I reuse, reduce, and recycle many different things such as trash and energy. Hello, my name is Brianna. I go to Las Palmitas Elementary School. And what makes me a clean air hero is I turn off electronics, I pick up trash, and I use a bus so there's not a lot of carbon dioxide. Hi, my name is Victoria. I'm from Las Palmitas Elementary School. I am a clean air hero because every day I pick up trash with my teachers and my friends. I also recycle plastic bottles and soda cans. Hi, I'm Carlos from Jordan High School. What makes me a clean air hero is to want to have a better, cleaner, healthier environment in the future. Hi, my name is Jordan. I am from Jordan. And what makes me a clean air hero is that I want a clean and safe environment. important to be a clean air hero because clean air quality provides us clean air for us to breathe, helps the environment, and lowers air pollution. But if the air is full of fossil fuels and carbon dioxide, the air is no longer healthy for us to breathe. It is important to be a clean air hero because unhealthy air can negatively affect living things as in plants, crops, trees, and reduce the growth of trees. Why it's important to be a clean air hero is because it helps us breathe better air than we're already breathing currently. To make others be a clean air hero is to encourage others to take action. Others can be clean air heroes by recycling and recycling. Others could be a clean air hero by donating clothes. Others could be a clean air hero by saving water, recycling, and throwing away their trash. Well, welcome back everyone again. I hope you were able to enjoy that wonderful video. It's inspiring to see our youth understand the importance of clean air and a clean environment. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce South Coast AQMD's Vice Chair Michael Cacciotti. Vice Chair Michael Cacciotti was elected to the South Pasadena City Council in 2001 and has served as mayor Mayor Pro Tem, and most recently as council member. He served, he has served on the governing board of the South Coast AQMD for 15 years. He was also a deputy attorney general with the state of California Department of Justice. Now, prior to that, Vice Chair Cacciotti was deputy state attorney with the California Department of Transportation. And prior to that, he served as an attorney for the Speaker Pro Tem of the California State Assembly. Now, Vice Chair Cacciotti has been actively involved in raising awareness of environmental issues in the region. He instituted the South Coast AQMD Electric Lawn Mower Exchange and Leaf Blower Exchange Program in South Pasadena and is responsible for the city's adoption of the low emission vehicle LEV purchase policy, which was subsequently adopted by the San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments. Now, please join me in welcoming Vice Chair Michael Cacciotti here on the stage.
I say it right? Catiotti? Okay, I'm just making sure. Thank you, Patricia, for both of you are welcome. I always leave out one thing on my resume. It's probably the most important. It was, I've been a volunteer youth soccer coach for the last 30 years, New City of Los Angeles, South Paso, Hamburg, El Sereno. And it always inspires me because every day is actually the last week when I was coaching in El Hamburg. To see the kids that I coach, and I love several, and I tell staff that three years ago, two years ago, I had three kids on my team for the first time with asthma. So we practice every game that inhaler or nebulizer. And just last week, I got a call Friday night, I'm sorry, Saturday night, from the mom said, Chris can't make the game tomorrow because he was cutting the grass, it was one of those hot days, and he had an asthma attack. So this is really important to us. So up next, we're diving into a plenary session entitled, Building a collaborative path or road as a former captain's attorney, road or highway to environmental justice. Community, technology, and as many of you saw in those breakout sessions, partnerships. Changes, but now for the really unprecedented transformational changes in public policy and new funding opportunities are now available to help overcome the challenges we face for many years in reducing air pollution in our overburdened and EJ communities. This panel now will discuss how local, state, and federal governments can collaborate with our communities to address these long-standing issues, including approaches to more equitable uh, public policy and identifying all those funding opportunities that you were talking about earlier in those sessions. I'd like to now introduce our moderator, a good friend, South Coast AQMD's Executive Officer, Mr. Wayne Nastry. Wayne, we're really lucky, previously served as the United States Environmental Protection Agency Regional Administrator for Region 9. That's the entire Western United States and some islands Wayne will tell you about. But before I go into a little more about Wayne, let me tell you, if Wayne ever invites you on a bike ride like he did myself a few weeks ago, be careful. After about 15 miles into the bike ride, I said, hey, Wayne, are we almost finished? He goes, no, we're just getting warmed up, Vice Chair. So be careful when Wayne White invites you on a bike ride. So under Wayne's leadership at the South Coast AQMD, he's been an integral part in our efforts to improve air quality through innovative and traditional approaches in order to meet our clean air goals over the next 15 years. Under Wayne's guidance, South Coast AQMD initiated a collaboration with other agencies across the nation. This was great to petition our US EPA to adopt tougher tailpipe emission standards for heavy duty trucks, not only more stringent, but 10 times more stringent than the current limits. His leadership has helped us in the region move forward implementing strategies and progressive air quality to bring cleaner and healthier air to our region. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Wayne Nastry. Wayne. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll be your moderator for this session. Building a collaborative path to environmental justice, community, technology, and partnerships. Most of the air pollution in our region comes from heavy duty trucks, ships, trains, and planes. These are generally what we refer to as our mobile sources. And we have to look at how that starts. We heard this morning from Chair Delgado that if you look at the San Pedro Bay Ports Complex, we have this network of highways, of rail lines that go all the way to the Inland Empire. And here in the Inland Empire, we see a number of warehouses. And as the chair had said, when we look at the movement of containerized goods, nearly 40% of the nation's containerized goods come through our region. Many of you know that we have the worst air quality in the nation. And we know that we need to employ zero emissions technology in order to meet our federal attainment standards. And we need to do it in a way that we equitably protect public health and address the longstanding public health disparities within our communities. A whole of government approach in collaboration with our community partners is needed to in order to affect that equitable and sustainable clean air future for all. So our panelists today will discuss strategies 
to overcome technological obstacles, such as building out our infrastructure and building out uh, the technology that's necessary to support our environmental justice communities as they implement these technologies. So I'm honored today to be joined by our incredible panelists. First, we'll have Alejandra Nunez, the US EPA Deputy Assistant Administrator for Mobile Sources at the Office of Air and Radiation. Prior to her appointment at EPA, Alejandra served as a senior attorney for Sierra Club's uh, environmental law program, focusing on litigation and regulatory advocacy on federal uh, environmental standards for light and heavy duty vehicles, carbon dioxide standards for new and existing power plants, state transportation and clean energy policies, and the integration of environmental justice in climate policy. So Alejandra unfortunately couldn't be with us here today, but she will be joining us by video. And I think she's in DC, so I'm not sure if we can see her yet, but she will be with us shortly. And next, I'd like to introduce uh, our next panelist is Deldi Reyes. Deldi is the director of the Office of Community Air Protection at the California Air Resources Board. And uh, her work focuses on reducing emissions and exposures in communities most impacted by air pollution. And prior to her role at CARB, Deldi served as the Environmental Justice Program Manager at the California Environmental Protection Agency where she co-led Cal EPA's racial equity team. She joined state service after a 25 year career at uh, EPA Region 8, where she actually helped to establish uh, the National Community, Community Action for Renewed Environment Program. And she also served as an inspector and enforcement officer in Clean Water and Clean Air Act programs. And next we'll have Nancy Sutley, as the uh, panelist. Nancy is the Deputy Mayor for Energy and Sustainability at the City of Los Angeles. She has a very distinguished career. She uh, leads Mayor Karen Bass's uh, environmental energy and sustainability programs. And she was previously the Senior Assistant General Manager uh, of External and Regulatory Affairs at the Department of Water and Power. And she was also the Chief Sustainability Officer and prior to her current role, Nancy led the White House Council on Environmental Quality for five years under President Barack Obama, a position for which she was unanimously confirmed by the US Senate. She also served as Mayor Villaraigosa's Deputy Mayor for Energy and Environmental, and is a member of the Board of Directors of the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. And our next panelist is Angela Logan. Senior Director of Environmental and Climate Justice at the Liberty Hill Foundation, a Los Angeles organization which advances social justice through grants, leadership, training, and campaigns. So Angela also serves on the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. He was appointed as one of four Western regional representatives by the Biden administration. And previously, Angela was a member of South Coast AQMD's Environmental Justice Advisory Group, uh, as well as US, EPA, US EPA's Mobile Source uh, and Ports uh, Technical Working Group. He's incorporated his life experiences into his work to advocate for communities impacted by transportation pollution. And if the panelists could please join me up on the stage. Let's give them a warm welcome as they make their way to the stage. Hi, Alay. Hello, Wayne. So I think she said hi, but I don't think we heard her. Do we have really? Alay on speaker? Alay? Can, can you hear me? No? We see you. We're making a few technical adjustments. OK. OK, there. I think we heard you. OK, great. Great. Good to see Excellent. you. 
Well, perhaps we can uh, start with Alay. And if each of our panelists could answer this question, if you could speak to how each of your agencies or organization is working to address air pollution related to goods movement, and how can these efforts support and or work in tandem with other levels of government and community partners? So, Alay. Hello all, and thank you, Wayne, for the kind invitation. And I want to apologize for not being able to join you all uh, in person as I had wished to uh, to do. But um, there's a lot of going on in Washington DC. But I I really look forward to to having this discussion. So let us get started with what what is happening at the federal level um, related to goods movement. These are very very exciting times. And, and as was mentioned before, um, the South Coast uh, and, and um, Wayne's leadership ignited years ago uh, um, a, a action from the agency to actually tackle uh, pollution from heavy duty trucks. So at the federal level, one, one of the most important actions that we completed back in December of last year is regulating emissions of nitrogen oxide, NOx, uh, that creates smog and soot, uh, for, and that is caused by heavy duty trucks, man, many of which are driving communities in the basin. We finally updated a standard that had not been looked at by EPA in more than 20 years. It's a, it's a strong standard and, and it's just the beginning of what uh, the administrator of EPA calls the clean trucks plan. Because back in April this of this uh, year, we issued a proposal to to regulate uh, greenhouse gas emissions from heavy duty trucks that is looking at the transition of the industry towards zero emission vehicles that we are in the process of finalizing right now. That standard. Um, well, let me let me mention. I I would also like to add that even though, as Wayne said, pollution for heavy duty from heavy duty trucks affects communities disproportionately, that the the standards that we EPA has finalized in this administration for light duty vehicles back in December of 2021, those those standards cover greenhouse gas emissions from for model years 2023 to 2026. And they are the starting point for a much stronger standard that we're currently developing, which we also proposed in April, along with heavy duty trucks. That is a multi pollutant standard for um, light duty and also medium duty vehicles, class 2B and 3 uh, trucks. All of these uh, rules together will help improve air quality for communities and translating in very, very substantial reductions in criteria pollutants that cause um, premature death, heart attacks, respiratory and cardiovascular illnesses, asthma, decreased lung functions. So, so they are very, very important. I just wanted to flag, for example, the combined benefits from our light duty and heavy duty proposals is more than 9 billion tons of, of CO2 emissions would be avoided if finalized as proposed, which is twice the CO2 emissions from whole, all the sources in the United States in year 2022. And the, the benefits, the economic monetary benefits for, for the light duty proposal are up to $1.6 trillion, which is um, some something that is very, very significant in the history of emission standards for vehicles for EPA, and then for heavy duty up to 320 billion. So we're trying to um, do ambitious rules to tackle climate change, to improve public health, and also to, to create cost savings for, for consumers that own vehicles or that also uh, buy those vehicles. I also wanted to mention, and, and this is thanks to the leadership of many community groups that, that came to the agency along with our partners like Wayne and, and others that have raised the importance of the issue around locomotive pollution. So, so we, as, as part of those conversations with many, many thanks to the environmental justice 
or organizations that, that are doing advocacy in this space, it helped EPA actually create a team that wasn't working on these issues. We now have a team, we are looking at what are the technology options to reduce emissions for locomotives in order for us to take decisions about what kind of standard is needed for, for locomotive engines. And also in the heavy duty rule, it's, it's, this is what I was gonna mention earlier. We also put, put out a proposal to actually correct uh, an old regulation of EPA that we believe might not, no longer be consistent with the Clean Air Act that, that would actually allow other states like, like California. And we, we have a process. We are trying to re make sure this is the correct interpretation, but there are states like California that are interested in making sure they also can have uh, locomotive um, regulations. So, so we're taking those actions in the regulatory side. And then we also have historic amounts of funding that we would never have expected. EPA is not used to handling very, very large uh, funds uh, in order to be able to, to help with the transition to zero emission vehicles and to partner with our state, tribal, and community um, advocates in, in this. So let me just mention really quickly as it relates to goods movement in the IRA, we have EPA received $1 billion to, to transition uh, to, to our clean heavy duty vehicles, class six and seven trucks, out of which 400 million are for non-attainment areas, and then $3 billion to invest in zero emission technologies and zero emission only in the ports, out of which 750 million must be invested in non-attainment areas. And as you might be aware, we also received $5 billion under the bipartisan infrastructure law under a new program that is called the Clean School Bus Program. And that where we are looking at how to invest, uh, enable uh, the replacement of all diesel school buses that are driving kids to school to, to cleaner buses. And, uh, and that also meets the commitments of, of Justice 40 that the administration has. They, we have many programs, the, the Environmental Justice Driving Communities Technical Assistance Program, which in partnership with DOE is, is gonna invest 177 million to help overburden communities across the country. So we are um, really excited to be in these times where we're putting together standards that will help reduce pollution and properly implement the funding programs that will help us uh, bring that transition along faster and for which I wanted to say, and we'll talk more about this, that engaging with members of communities is critical to us to make sure we design these programs the right way that creates the benefits that, that we are seeking in terms of public health and, and other benefits. Thank you, Alejandra. Many of you know that Alejandra was here just two weeks ago. And so she really does, uh, mean what she says when this is very important to her and we appreciate all that she's doing. Deldi, can you tell us what CARB is doing? Hello. Thank you, Wayne, for the invitation to be here today and to be part of this very important conversation about goods movement. Um, and more importantly, how we, in a very coordinated way at all levels of government, tackle the negative health consequences from goods movement. As the statewide regulatory agency responsible for air quality in California, we work in tandem with 35 local air districts and with the federal U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. We target emission reductions from mobile sources that are part of goods movement through regulations paired with complementary incentives programs. Local, state, and federal regulations are absolutely essential and we need to do more on that front. But we also know that if we're gonna reduce existing disparities, we actually have to target additional efforts and resources at the local scale to really address and um, pay attention to the communities that have been the most disproportionately impacted and this is where the Community Air Protection Program, which was created by AB 617 in 2017, comes into play. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. 
Uh, but back to the regulatory front, CARB has adopted regulations for transport refrigeration units, trucks, uh, commercial harbor craft, ocean going vessels while at berth and locomotives. As we just heard, CARB very much has a very strong interest in regulating locomotives. Our recently approved advanced clean fleece regulation will create a fully zero emission drayage fleet by 2035, starting with requirements that all new vehicle additions to the drayage fleet be zero emissions starting January 1, 2024. In California, we do use incentives to accelerate compliance with regulations that are focusing on getting us to zero emission technologies. Using incentives helps increase, increase the rate of adoption of new technologies, uh, new vehicles, equipment, and it helps decrease the cost of compliance for single owner operators and small businesses, especially those businesses located in priority populations. The cornerstone of our advanced technology heavy duty incentives is our clean truck and bus voucher incentive project or HVIP. Since 2010, through this program, funding has been provided to accelerate and transform the market by reducing the purchase price of zero emission technologies. To date, $844 million in vouchers have been issued and over 55% of vehicles have been deployed in priority communities. Our annual funding plan process for this program serves as the, the blueprint for how we spend the HVIP incentives. This includes the allocation for next year. And I'm happy to say our next workshop on this plan, on this funding plan will be held on September 19th. So just around the corner. Thank you. Thanks, Del D. Nancy. Uh, thanks very much uh, for having me here, Wayne, and uh, to all of you, it's really an honor to be here on behalf of the city of Los Angeles. Uh, so, um, uh, Mayor Bass has uh, been in office now a little, uh, about just about nine months, uh, and, you know, we have a, a lot of challenges in Los Angeles um, dealing with a, a number of um, very pressing issues around housing and homelessness. Um, but the mayor also recognizes that we have other crises that we have to address, and the climate crisis is one of them. And I think the uh, the mayor's, you know, approach is really around um, how do we bring, um, in, in, you know, sort of the ambitious environmental goals to uh, into communities and and have them centered on communities. Um, how do we, uh, in thinking about what the city can and should be doing to uh, address um, both greenhouse gas emissions and and uh, the criteria pollutants and other toxic uh, pollution in our communities that really has to be centered on on community um, and uh, and also in a way that we um, we take advantage of the investments that the that the city will make that uh, the assistance from uh, from state government and federal government um, to invest in our communities to to uh, ensure that the green transition brings jobs and economic opportunities to communities that have, have too often been been left behind. So one of the things that's unusual but not unique about Los Angeles is that we are, as a city, a, an owner of a lot of infrastructure. Uh, the port of Los Angeles, uh, along with its sister port in Long Beach, um, as you all know, is the largest port complex in the U.S., an important um, economic engine for not just the city of Los Angeles, but for the region. Uh, but it also uh, ends up uh, that a disproportionate um, burden uh, falls on disadvantaged communities in Los Angeles and throughout the region uh, for the, the economic benefit of having um, you know, the, the flow of goods in and out of the port. Uh, so, for all those, you know, 9.99 T-shirts that are going uh, to Kansas City, uh, there's pollution that comes to to all of our communities, and we and we have to address that. Uh, we also, as a city, uh, own the Department of Water and Power, uh, the largest municipally owned utility in the in the U.S. Uh, and the city departments, um, those infrastructure owners working together, I think, really are a key to unlocking. Um, addressing some of these environmental harms associated with goods movement and really looking at the opportunities in electrification. Uh, so 
one of the things uh, we think about is how do we make sure that these departments are working together? So the Department of Water and Power uh, and the Port of Los Angeles uh, are, are uh, working together to um, ensure that there's sufficient electrical capacity to support the electrification of, uh, of trucks, of uh, other heavy duty equipment at the port, and that can support the expansion uh, of electrification uh, in, in the port. Uh, also working together uh, on uh, as part of the statewide uh, California application uh, for a, a hydrogen hub, looking at the opportunities to use green hydrogen uh, to um, help reduce uh, emissions uh, from uh, heavy duty equipment at the port. How do we how do we take that what appears to be promising technology and and really um, bring it towards reducing uh, the harmful air pollution at, at our ports. Um, but we really have to do this not as um, departments, you know, working in silo, the city working in silo, but really working with, with communities uh, across, across the city and across the region uh, to ensure that, um, that, we are, um, that we are meeting communities where they are and that we are, uh, we are working together uh, to to address these these environmental harms that have affected our communities for too long. Um, looking at other levels of government, uh, we um, thanks to EPA, we're all working together on some uh, exciting uh, uh, planning around uh, climate pollution reduction grants and looking at those opportunities. Um, working with the County of Los Angeles, with the County of Orange, with uh, with the transportation agencies in both counties, uh, with uh, with others, uh, really to uh, uh, identify uh, the most promising types of projects um, that can help us reduce uh, contribution to to greenhouse gas emissions, and a lot of that will be focused around uh, uh, around goods movement. Uh, other, uh, we're very grateful for, for for the opportunity to get funding from the federal government to support a lot of these projects. Uh, and to uh, sort of accelerate uh, the transition to to zero carbon and hopefully zero uh, smog forming pollutant pollution um, technologies in and around the port, uh, and to really um, seize this opportunity. Uh, this may be once in a lifetime, hopefully not once in a lifetime opportunity um, to to get some help um, with the funding. Um, and so, you know, at at the end of the day. Um, you know, there's no, there's no one agency, there's no one uh, person um, who has all the answers. I mean, we really have to uh, work in partnership um, to uh, to identify, address, and, and really um, incorporate um, sort of the benefits that come that should come to our communities from uh, from working together to reduce uh, both harmful air pollution and and greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you, Nancy. I really appreciate your convening and uh, collaborative efforts to bring together all the parties as we focus on the climate action plans and trying to pursue the federal funding. And it really reinforces the theme of collaboration and working together. Uh, but I want to go to the, the next question. I'm going to take a little bit out of order. So I'm going to ask Angelo. Angelo, can you sort of share with us from your perspective what resources are available to support community-based organizations uh, and individuals as they work uh, with government agencies to address air pollution? I know this is an issue that's very near to your heart. Well, thank you, uh, Wayne. And I just want to start by saying what an honor it is to participate on a panel with such amazing folks. And so thank you for the invitation. So I'm with the Liberty Hill Foundation, which is a social justice foundation with a major program in environmental and climate justice. And at Liberty Hill, we believe that communities have the answers to advance justice in their communities. And so we really want to make sure that we are um, supporting and fostering communities and building power in their local communities to address the issues that they're dealing with directly so that they can participate and advance um, their solutions through policy and systemic change. And so through that, what we um, do at Liberty Hill is one, we raise resources um, in many forms, some monetary, some and other types of resources. We uh, provide leadership development and capacity building. And we also see ourselves as a convener. So one of the things that we do within convening folks is 
so that folks may find opportunities to collaborate amongst themselves across different communities, but also with different uh, government agencies. And so one of the programs that we're working on um, now is a program we call um, EJ Ready, which is to work with a cohort of environmental justice organizations so that they can be well prepared and positioned to access the Justice 40 covered programs and other public funds. Mm -hmm. And um, we realize that there's information that folks need to be able to access those resources um, in a whole variety of ways, just knowing how to navigate the systems, what types of registries and things they need to um, enroll in, um, how to comply with the different uh, programs, but also how to implement the programs that they wanna see in their communities, whether as our brick and mortar projects like um, pocket parks or electrification of corridors, um, but then also being able to collaborate with their partners, but again, both in the community, but also within the agencies that might have jurisdiction over those areas. So, you know, we're using that space to be able to identify all of these different issue areas we're working with consultants to really identify the landscape and the mapping of those programs. Also um, consultants to be able to share toolkits and, and um, workshops on how organizations might be able to uh, be positioned and shore up their organization so that they can actually, uh, impl uh, actually access, um, implement and manage the programs of these uh, public dollars and then deploy and implement the, the actual work itself. So we see that as a really important piece in terms of a resource. Um, and we encourage um, environmental justice organizations and community-based organizations to participate in these programs. Another program that we're implementing is the Environmental Leadership Initiative. It's a fellowship. And we just launched um, the applications on Monday. And so uh, if you know folks that are interested in participating in leadership development, um, fellowships, uh, you know, go to the Liberty Hill um, website and check out the, the applications. This is a three-year long program where folks will learn leadership skills on how to, um, to become more effective in advocating for your community and running nonprofits to advance environmental justice and climate justice. It also comes along with a um, grant to the organization that you're affiliated with and also resources for um, your own individual um, development. Thank you, Angelo. You know, with all these funds, there's so many requirements and having the, the training and the tools available to learn how to do it is so critical. And I know so much appreciated in the community. Um, let's go back to Alay. And Alay, I know that your involvement with communities is one of the things that really drives you. But can you share with us, how can communities and individuals engage with, with you at, at EPA and other organizations uh, to ensure policies and funding programs are building an equitable and sustainable future for all? LA. Thank you, Wayne. So let, let me talk first about regulations. We are, of course, in, environmental justice um, has always been it's work that that the agency has been doing for years, but environmental justice is a priority of this administration. And we, since the beginning, have looked at our approach. Well, how, what are we doing? Where can we do better on regulations and then the funding? So to give you some examples about uh, things we are doing in the development of regulations is engaging more with community groups on the comment process. We do webinars to provide information on the, the key aspects that we're seeking comment, in particular highlighting those that, that based on all the interactions that we have with community groups that we know are important to them, but also on the process of how do you submit comments. Sometimes, as Angelo mentioned, is very overwhelming. There's too much information coming out of the federal government. So we're trying to provide more information in that way that it's only focused on community organizations where we try we're trying to improve our process for engagement so that folks get involved in commenting and help us create a record that speaks to the issues that as as angelo says they know what the solutions are right also the approach to public hearings in the covid pandemic we started 
this trend of doing hearings online that has pluses and minuses, right? Because people appreciate be meeting in person, but one piece of feedback we have heard from community folks is that that virtual option allows many organizations that would otherwise not be able to come to Washington DC to engage. So going forward, we want to keep both options and we continue to do a lot of uh, virtual public hearings precisely because of what we've heard about uh, the ability for, for folks to testify in that way and, and provide their input on our regulatory proposals. We are also providing like interpretation and having broader ranges of hours so that, so that members of, of communities are able to attend at, a, at times that are more feasible for them. So we, we have been trying to approach that in a much more conscious way. Our approach to how, how do we do EG analysis of the regulations, many important community groups that are doing very, very important work on the ground are helping us ground truth whether uh, our our analysis are correct we are we have a lot of technical experts but folks are on the ground and they know where the pollution hotspots and the communities that are affected by all this um proximity to major highways and and truck pollution and so on so so that's on the regulatory side and then on the funding programs we have been already implementing the clean school bus program for a while and in that context we did a lot of engagement sessions and webinars with groups, organizations that actually wanted to engage and really have helped us organize and talk to school districts on the ground, in particular high need, low income school districts that want to move to the transition toward this transition but don't have enough information about how to do it. I want to thank all the folks from, from um, community organizations that are actually help us do that work. We did a lot of, of that engagement and also with the school districts on how to apply and going through all the different parts of the process and we will continue to do that so i just wanted to flag that for the ports program the three billion dollars that are available for uh, zero emission vehicle technologies in the ports and then clean heavy duty that is one billion for cla classes six and seven trucks we are in that process we put out a request for information it's it's a process where folks submitted comments and we're looking at them, but here in the agency, we're discussing how do we um, get feedback from community organizations and, and that's, we are currently developing those details and we'll share more information uh, once, once we're able, hopefully soon. Thanks, Elaine. That $4 billion sounds awfully big and I know we can use it all. Uh, and really appreciate the fact that you're reducing barriers to access and utilizing so many tools. And we, we so appreciate your efforts. Deldi, how's CARB working on increasing outreach and availability? Uh, what a wonderful conversation uh, this has been. Uh, thank you so much um, for this great question. Um, one of the things that has really sparked, I think within CARB, um, a renewed um, effort to engage meaningfully with communities has actually been uh, the Community Air Protection Program. Um, partnership is essential to making this program work. And the ripple effects um, from um, that program have spread across CARB. Um, I mentioned the locomotive regulation earlier. Um, uh, the, the CARB division that is responsible for that regulation began that effort with listening sessions, scoping, uh, hearing from communities about what the concerns were um, before concepts were even drafted as a way to start that process of engagement much earlier. I also want to give a shout out to my colleague, Lisa Chilodakis, who's in the room today. Lisa is part of a cross-divisional team at the Air Resources Board um, that is focusing on how, as a, as a whole agency, we can do community engagement uh, much more meaningfully. And this work group has established a draft uh, model and framework for engaging with communities and has actually secured through a small contract community experts to advise us and vet that framework with us. Um, before we start um, training on it so that we can make sure we get it right. Of course, um, we're not waiting for that to be final. We have to keep doing um, the, the regulatory work that um, is needed. And I just wanna mention that on that rulemaking front, we definitely encourage participation in the new regulations that are gonna um, uh, impact uh, and reduce emissions from other goods movement sources. 
such as, for example, a new regulation going back to transport refrigeration units to get additional reductions, um, ocean going vessels while in transit, and also regulations for cargo handling equipment. Um, and then I, I will also just say that, again, going back to the community air protection program, you know, the word equity is actually not found in the text of AB 617. But the entire approach behind that law, which requires CARB and air districts to focus our attention in the most disproportionately impacted communities, is all about equity. Um, and while we have 19 communities in the program, which represent about 4 million people in the state, um, that's not enough. Um, we heard from Chair Delgado earlier this morning how important this program is and how important it is to properly fund this program. And we will continue to fight for that and partner with others to fight for that adequate and, and more robust funding. And in the meantime, we want to take um, advantage and partner and leverage and um, apply together um, for these federal opportunities to bring benefits to communities in California that have been nominated for the Community Air Protection Program, but that have not been selected. So um, that's a big uh, focus for uh, us in the next five years of implementing the Community Air Protection Program. And uh, you will see it in our draft blueprint, which is the framework for how we implement the law. Uh, we go to our board on October 26 with the revised blueprint that really um, calls for CARB and air districts to focus our attention, not only on the 19 communities, but also on the places that have been nominated over and over and that we would want to do that by also using pathways like community-focused enforcement, um, using AIR grants, our tool for uh, granting to organizations, community-based organizations and tribal governments, the resources to allow them, as Angela was saying, to take the answers that they have about what they know they need in their community and put their own local community emission reductions plan together. Communities can plan, uh, absolutely, and, and we feel that it's our job to make sure they have the resources to do so. And then finally, back to funding, um, the other element in our blueprint is to bring more flexibility to how those incentives programs are used um, so that we can benefit more communities. Thank you. Thanks, Del D. Uh, just to make sure, Lisa, can you stand up so that everybody knows to talk to you? Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Um, truly, AB 617 has been transformative on how government at the state and local level interact in communities. And I think it's one of the major accomplishments and we still have a long way to go, but it, it really is inspiring. Nancy, share with us your thoughts in terms of how is the city of Los Angeles working to, to build those equitable policies and programs and how people can access you? Well, uh, uh, people know where to find us. Uh, we actually, uh, last week, um, we, we met with a, a group of uh, environmental, environmental justice stakeholders just to talk about priorities and, and um, issues of concern. Um, and we've been doing that uh, regularly uh, since I um, arrived back in city hall and, uh, February, uh, and uh, and we'll and we'll continue to do that. Um, and you know, I think there one of the things that I you know was very um, uh, kind of uh, hopeful and helpful about um, many of these um, uh, times that we we convene with uh, with stakeholders, environmental justice, and and environmental stakeholders is. They, there's a lot of uh, common um, priorities, uh, which means we all have a lot of work to do, and and the city um, certainly can't do it uh, do it by itself, uh, and and would will not be successful if we tried to to kind of do everything on our own. We really have to do it uh, with with our communities, and I think the um, types of priorities that are going forward. Um, there are many opportunities to interact with the city. Um, for example, uh, some more formal, for example, um, the Department of Water and Power is about to release its, uh, what they call its LA100 uh, equity strategies um, report, uh, which was looking at energy burden uh, and, and, and uh, climate burden um, as we make a green transition to 100% clean energy 
uh, for the city of Los Angeles. Uh, and there were uh, steering committees and, and, uh, and advisory groups that really informed um, a lot of the issues that uh, that were analyzed, and as as the department continues um, to push forward, making uh, making uh, recommendations around programs and policies that advance equity uh, at at uh, at the Department of Water and Power, um, and um, you know it, it, we're always looking for opportunities to um, interact with our with our residents with. With community groups, um, and um, uh, and it's important as we push forward on on all of these strategies um, to to make sure that they are uh, addressing you know the highest needs and of 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 all of our uh, communities. And I think we're very fortunate in Los Angeles to uh, to have uh, uh, amazing uh, community based organizations, including Liberty Hill and others, who are really um, uh, are not shy about coming to the city, uh, and it's really important that we get that that feedback, that input, um, uh, and and really and hold us accountable uh, for what the city is doing. Thanks, Nancy. Angela, maybe you can share what's the best way for people to work with Liberty Hill. Yeah, thank you. Well, you know, um, one of the things that that we really work hard at is bringing folks together trying to raise resources so folks have the ability and the capacity to participate in spaces like this and many others. So when we're thinking about collaborating across, you know, the variety of um, venues, whether that's within the city, the counties, the state, or the federal government, we really want to engage with folks. And we're really thinking about how we um, play that role as convener to bring together a larger environmental justice convening so that we can find opportunities for that type of collaboration. So I just um, wanna make sure that um, as I kind of make my way throughout the day that I hand out as many cards and connect with as many community-based environmental justice organizations as possible so that we can work together to really advance environmental justice directed by the solutions that you all come up with. Thank you, Angelo. The community aspect is so important of what we do, but I think what's even more important is demonstrating that it works. So my last question, and Ale will go back to you. Can you give us uh, an example of a successful collaboration or a successful effort that advanced uh, what it is that we're talking about, equity and environmental justice? So for, from the perspective of EPA's work, we have been um, implementing since 2008 the DERA Diesel Emissions Reduction Act program. I think that could be an example of very successful collaboration because even though EPA focuses on national regulations of new vehicles and, and engines, right, and, and the law requires us to give industry lead time to comply there are millions of legacy diesel engines that are that continue to emit uh, criteria pollutants that causes uh, respiratory and cardiovascular illness and affects in particular low income and and uh, communities of color that live in proximity to highways and and all these different sources. So I I think in in EPA that has been a very successful um, program in the sense of we really have prioritized good movement projects near ports, rail yards, distribution center, prioritizing the areas that have suffered most of the disproportionate impacts. And we have never had major amounts of funding. Now we have more there funding on the, under the IRA, but in this, in between 20, 2008 and 2018, we have replaced or helped replace or retrofitted nearly 74,000 engines or vehicles, which represents about 8 billion in health benefits. So that, that I think has been a very successful program. We now have more uh, funding for there under the Inflation Reduction Act. But as I mentioned, what we really want um, is, is to make sure that we design the, the next round of Inflation Reduction Act programs for ports uh, and heavy duty vehicles correctly in a, in a way that, that can enable those successful collaborations so that we can ensure that as those investments are made, 
communities benefit. And this is why I, I really wanted to flag that um, environmental justice tic tacs, uh, because that 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 uh, source of funding for community groups could be very important to engage in all these processes. Thank you, Leigh. The, the DEAR program is a program that's very near and dear to me. Uh, and I'll just go to Deldi, and then we'll just go through the rest of the panel, and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah, so I want to um, just note that during uh, earlier in the session, there were some wonderful breakout discussions, and I sat in on the one about bridging the gap um, for resources for communities. And I heard so much around uh, valuable lessons from community leaders and um, who are in the receiving and, and uh, end of, of grants. Um, and so I'm happy to say that um, the 617 law actually requires CARB to administer funds that are directly associated and reserved for community-based organizations. And that is through the Community Air Grants Program. Trish Johnson, Trish, raise your hand, there you are. Trish Johnson is CARB staff lead for administering the Community Air Grants Program. And since 2018, we have a long history of supporting uh, uh, over 60 unique organizations, community-based organizations and tribes in uh, implementing projects that they have prioritized in fleshing out partnerships that they have created to address problems that are um, seen as priorities and also enhance their, their capacity to participate in our 617 process. I wanna share a quick example from the Arvin Lamont Community Steering Committee, not in LA, sorry, uh, in the Valley, uh, the San Joaquin Valley, where that community had included in their emission reduction plan a priority. They were concerned about the impacts from oil and gas wells in their community. And they wanted the Air District and CARB to come together and, and make sure those, those wells were in compliance. So uh, we did that. And we also brought in CalGEM under the Department of Conservation. Um, we could have done our enforcement work quietly behind the scenes without any input from community and then come back at the end and said, here's what we did. But instead we used the forum that was provided by that community steering committee to engage with residents right at the beginning to hear what their concerns were. It helped tailor the inspection plans. And we also heard that communities wanted feedback very soon. They wanted to know what's going on with these wells. These wells have approximately 40% leak rate. And we're talking about methane, very potent greenhouse gas. Um, and there also were some concerns about associated air toxics associated with methane that the community was concerned about. So as a result of participating in this effort, um, we've done several rounds of inspections in Arvin, also moved over to nearby Shafter and are sharing the results the next day uh, with the community steering committee and the public about what we're finding. So that meets the need that the community had of wanting uh, better compliance and also more information about what was happening with this sector. Thank you, Daldi. Nancy? Yeah, well, maybe I'll, I'll pick up on the oil and gas team uh, because I think it's a great example in Los Angeles of of uh, a real collaboration uh, to uh, with the city uh, between the city and uh, community based organizations. People organized, uh, spent many years organizing to try to um, phase out oil and gas uh, production in what is the nation's largest urban oil field, which is which is Los Angeles. Um, and so uh, last year, uh, the city council passed an ordinance to phase out oil and gas drilling um, in the city of Los Angeles. The county is, is uh, following, followed suit. I don't remember which order, uh, but, um, you know, that's a, that's a, a I think, an a incredible um, story of both success and persistence or persistence and success uh, in, in getting to uh, to that point, but really not. Uh, not just saying, okay, we, uh, the city now is an ordinance, everybody go home and be happy. Uh, we really have to, A, make sure that it, uh, it's complied with, but also looking at things like, um, how do we address some of the economic uh, consequences of, of the phase out of oil and gas drilling? Uh, so we've been working with, with the County of Los Angeles and with a group of stakeholders around uh, some just transition work for uh, looking at, um, Oh, oil and gas workers, and interestingly, as they were surveyed about the kinds of careers they were interested in, uh, working in renewable energy and, and green energy came out as the as, uh, by by a lot uh, the most interesting place uh, they were looking to land. So, um, I think uh, 
the the other uh, example I give, and I, I say this with uh, recognizing that it means that sometimes you have to bop us over the head, um, and and that's the the origin of the ports uh, cleaner action plan. That really um, it was because uh, there were uh, there was litigation around um, port expansion. Uh, sequel litigation and others, and a lot of organizing uh, to get the ports to the point where they're like, okay, we get it now. You bopped us over the head. Uh, we really have to move um, kind of in tandem uh, to, uh, if we're going to grow the port, we have to clean the port. Um, we can all have a discussion about how successful that's been, but but it really did come from um, I think that in that interplay uh, between uh, the communities that uh, organized um, to truly try to hold, hold the ports uh, accountable for the pollution that was burdening their communities. Thank you, Nancy. Angelo, close us out. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll just say that um, there's been many levels of success and challenges, you know, whether that's um, advisory councils at the federal level, state, or local you know, city jurisdictions. But but I, what I want to focus in on is, you know, the need to make those collaborations and efforts really meaningful so that folks that are involved, whether, you know, regardless of what stakeholder group they're representing, that those the involvement is meaningful and that they're developing action plans for implementing. Um, and that they're not just, you know, sitting in a room to meet just to meet. Um, but they're really going to develop action plans that can be implementable. And that means that the decision makers, the policy makers also have to be invested in that process. I think another layer to that is if we're talking about environmental justice and equity, that we need to convene folks through an equity lens and level the playing field. You have folks that maybe have full-time lobbyists that can participate full-time in those types of processes. And so there's other folks from the community that that can't. And so, you know, that might mean resourcing them so that they can participate, making child care available so that they can participate because, you know, they need child care uh, at those times. So it's really about the meaningful public participation and making sure that we engage all stakeholders in a way that we're thinking about equity and environmental justice. Great. Thank you, Angelo. And I really want to take the opportunity now to thank our panel. I know we could be here all afternoon. There's so much information to be learned and gleaned, but uh, let's thank our panelists. And I'm sure they're going to be around for at least a little while. And if you have questions, please feel free to approach them. They love what they do. They love interacting with all of you. And so we look forward to more in-depth discussions uh, later in the day. But now I'd like to welcome Rick Garcia to the stage. So Rick. That's okay, don't get up. Listen, um, we're in the home stretch and thank you so much for uh, participating in this year's event. Uh, my name is Rick Garcia. I will be the uh, MC for the remainder of the event. News does not take a day off. So Leticia Juarez is on her way to go do a story for ABC7, but she wants everybody to know how important this event was for her today and that she be here today. Her uh, husband and children are, are uh, members of the Riverside community. And so uh, clean air and the importance of how we can go about um, making sure our air is cleaner is really important to them. Uh, as a family. So a big thank you to uh, Leticia Juarez for uh, joining us today. At this time, it is uh, now my pleasure to introduce Supervisor V. Manuel Perez. Supervisor Victor Manuel Perez was appointed to the South Coast AQMD Governing Board back in August of uh, 2018. He was appointed by Governor Jerry Brown on May 9th of 2017 to the Riverside County Board of Supervisors and subsequently was elected to a four-year term in June of 2018. In 2008, Supervisor Perez was elected to the California State Assembly representing Eastern Riverside County and Imperial County. A champion for Eastern Riverside County, Supervisor Perez had uh, more than 60 pieces of legislation that was signed into law to help create jobs, jumpstart the uh, local renewable energy industry, and make neighborhoods safer. 
His legislation focused on many important areas, such as jobs, small business, education, infrastructure, renewable energy, transportation, air quality, environment, public safety, and many more. There's a big S on his chest, not for supervisor, but for Superman Perez. And we'd like to welcome him to the stage now. Supervisor? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for that uh, very generous introduction. And it uh, feels good to be here near my alma mater, UC Riverside, and next to my office down the street, not too far from here. And I see some friends here. We got Jaime Alonso from Good Alternatives. I guess you were here earlier speaking as well. Lachey, oh, where is Lachey? I know Lachey's back there somewhere. Nice to see you, Lachey. Obviously, the team here from AQMD, Wayne, Michael Cacciotti, our vice chair. I understand that Vanessa was here earlier as well and did her presentation. I'm glad to, obviously, you already know that uh, Vanessa, our, our chairwoman, Vanessa Delgado, is the first uh, Latina, the first uh, mujer first woman uh, to chair AQMD and very proud of her and her efforts and the goals that she set, the goals that she has set for uh, AQMD. And, you know, I'm looking at the agenda. You got to hear some great stuff today. Obviously you heard about empowerment and making sure that we fight environmental injustice, environmental racism, uh, and you heard from folks like Kaya Williams, folks like, folks like Dr. Lee from San Diego State University, uh, Karen Kumar from California Strategic Growth Council, Mark Carell from Breathe SoCal, Jacqueline Badejo, Watts Clean Air and Energy Committee. You also heard about folks that talked about job training and environmental equity. Layla Lee from the office of Mayor Karen Bass, who was my former speaker when I actually was in the state legislature. Ana Luz Gonzalez Vasquez, UCLA Labor Center. Estelle Reyes, Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator. Jaime, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, Mike Slavic, Rio Honda College. Uh, all these individuals had nothing but great things to say about how we're gonna continuously fight environmental injustice, environmental racism, how we're gonna continuously fight against air pollution in our own backyards, especially in underserved areas, underserved communities. You heard from Wayne Nastri, our moderator, and our person in charge, if you will, our CEO of AQMD, Alejandra Nunez from EPA, who I've had the pleasure of working with her on issues dealing with Oasis Mobile Home Park and issues dealing with uh, the lack of clean drinking water uh, out in the eastern Coachella Valley. Uh, Angela Logan, Liberty Hill Foundation. Nancy Sutley, Office of Los Angeles Mayor. Karen Bass, once again. Dildi Reyes from CARB. And now you're going to hear in a few minutes from our keynote, Assembly member Eduardo Garcia. And so uh, a few things about Eduardo very quickly on a personal. I have a script here, which I'll read from, uh, but let me just state out loud that, you know, I, I people know him as Eduardo. If you go to Sacramento, I know him as Eddie. And the reason why I know him as Eddie is because I grew up with the guy. You know, we uh, we grew up in a little town back then, it was still a little town. It was called Coachella, California, a farm worker community. And uh, it's grown quite a bit now. Back when we were growing up, uh, went to CV High, Bobby Duke, Peter Pendleton, those schools through Coachella Unified School District. But back in the day, we probably had around 8,000 to 10,000 folks in the area. A uh, farm working community, as I mentioned earlier, Many folks from Mexico, many folks from Latin America, immigrantes, 
But our fathers as well actually worked together. Uh, our fathers worked uh, for the city of India once they left the fields. Uh, and they worked in the parks, they worked in, on water issues, uh, on trash, graffiti, uh, in order to make sure that our communities were clean. And so, and, and quite honestly, even Eddie actually grew up <laughs> on the street right next to where I lived up until a few months ago, where I raised my family, uh, what we call the U. It was called the U because it was only one way in, one way out, and it was like a U-shape type of thing. Um, but Eddie's come a long way, and I've had the pleasure of knowing him, obviously, all these years and seeing him grow and develop. And he also worked for me when I was in the state legislature. He also worked uh, for Ben Wessel, Senator Ben Wessel. Um, and he is now and was the mayor for the city of Coachella, a council member for the city of Coachella. Uh, and as well mentored many people along the way uh, to the point that he continuously uh, mentors uh, the young generation that's coming up and that's fighting the good fight, uh, that's willing to fight for social justice. And I remember the day when I came back from uh, school uh, and he was in the community, I think at that time, he might have been at UC Riverside or maybe finishing up UC Riverside. This is around 2000 and I want to say 2003, 2002. Uh, and I had just finished graduating from my master's degree at Harvard University and came home to Coachella. And he mentioned to me that, Manuel, it's time. And I said, time for what? He goes, well, we've been organizing for quite a bit of years now. It's time for us to run for office. And I said to him, well, I'm not sure if we're ready yet. You know, we got to put in the time. Uh, you know, I know we live in our communities. I know that we care for our communities. Uh, this is our barrio. Uh, we care. And we know that uh, there is still quite a bit of racism and discrimination and intolerance. There is still a level of haves and have nots. But I'm not sure if we're ready. And then he said to me, well, if not now, then when? When will we be ready? So uh, I think we made the conscientious decision right then and there that he would run for city council and I would run for school board. We formed an organization called Raices Roots, a grassroots entity that worked on developing the next generation at that time uh, to get involved in policy, politics, arts, and cultural, culturalism, if you will, and the environment. And ultimately to ensure that people have access uh, to good health care. And so we ran and we actually won. Uh, we thought that maybe it might take us another uh, race in order for us to get there, but I thought that maybe... Uh, after winning, we must have been ready for it because here we are today. Uh, years later, Eddie is now the assembly member representing Imperial County and Riverside County, which is now known as the 36th assembly district. And he was elected in 2014 and he currently presides as the chair of the assembly committee on utilities and energy. Uh, overseeing critical issues such as ensuring energy stability, affordability, and safety, as well as, as well as California's groundbreaking efforts to decarbonize its electrical grid. Now, during Eduardo Garcia's tenure, our assembly member, he's been able to pass SB 32, AB 197, uh, which is landmark climate change legislation that established California's emission reduction mandate and a policy framework that prioritized climate investments for disproportionately impacted communities. In 2017, Assemblymember Garcia authored AB 398 and AB 617, which you heard about just recently, which developed a statewide climate action plan and the Community Air Protection Program. The United States Environmental Protection Agency recognized 
Assembly Member Garcia with a National Climate Leadership Award. He is a proud father, husband, and lifelong resident of the Coachella Valley and of the city of Coachella, in which um, he raises his sweet daughter. We call her Ella from Coachella. And I'm sure he'll speak to that a little later. But with that said, I have the pleasure of introducing and asking all of you to give it up for Assembly Member Eduardo Garcia. Thank you, Supervisor uh, Perez, for that very heartfelt uh, invitation. And when I when I say heartfelt, I, you know, it's not just uh, the supervisor for me that's introducing us. It's a uh, it's a good friend, uh, someone who I uh, love dearly, uh, not only for his commitment uh, to public service, but you know, the supervisor and I have been in a lot of different uh, battles over the years. Uh, to advance uh, the agenda uh, centered around people uh, in the eastern parts of the Coachella Valley. And the supervisor and I have also uh, had our uh, circumstances where we've had differences of opinions and differences of approach. But when it's all said and done, we've always worked to find consensus and to lead, uh, to lead those who are expecting us to come together, uh, find solutions, and, and move the agenda forward. And so I'm very grateful to him, uh, to his leadership, uh, to his mentorship. And uh, I knew that when I got to the assembly, uh, I was gonna have some big shoes to fill. And there's no question, uh, no question about that. Uh, I'm very honored to have been uh, selected to say a few words. You know, I'm in the Willie Brown room here in the uh, state capitol and right through that door, you know, we've got a couple hundred votes that we'll be taking over the course of the next 48 hours. And, you know, something to be said about that. Uh, for me, you know, sitting at that desk and paying attention to what's coming up and what we're pushing the red button or the green button for is significant, but this conversation was just as important. So I am very honored to be here with you. My, uh, my agenda uh, getting to Sacramento was important uh, to, uh, you know, focus on the people that sent us to Sacramento and, and really center it around, you know, people-driven policy, uh, looking at the issues that have plagued our communities for a long time. And I know the subject uh, matter today is environmental justice, public health. And, uh, you know, it's those two themes, those two items that have driven us to engage into the climate change space. Um, as it relates to the policies that were highlighted that we've been able to work on over my tenure in the legislature. But you know, this issue of clean air and clean water is more than just an agenda. It's, it's very personal given the circumstances that we personally have seen uh, that we face that our uh, community has uh, been challenged with for many, many years. And so uh, making sure that we carry that message to Sacramento has always been uh, the focal point, um, centering our policies around the improvement of public health and the nexus between clean air and clean water is very clear and direct. Um, I have a nine-year-old little girl that Manuel made reference to who suffers from asthma and unfortunately has to miss a lot of days from school and cannot do the normal things that a nine-year-old little girl would love to do whether it be on the playground with her friends or in the community running around. It's a very difficult thing to watch. It's a very difficult thing to take in, uh, to see a nine-year-old struggling uh, to breathe after a kind of little uh, chase around the house uh, with her friends and or her, uh, her colleagues uh, there from the neighborhood. Uh, our policies uh, during my time in the legislature have been to ensure that there is a voice for communities who have suffered from a tremendous amount of uh, disproportional impacts when it comes to uh, not having the clean air and the access to clean water and the intersection to public health and using data to drive the decision-making on why certain types of policies were important to propose and ultimately advocate for and get signed into law. You know, some of the conversations that were taking place in the prior panel were about AB 617, a, a piece of legislation that we got to author 
uh, co-author with Christina Garcia, where we wanted to make sure that the community was driving this discussion and working with the appropriate agencies to be able to implement those policies uh, to improve the circumstances on the ground. And I know that it hasn't been an easy process, but it's been a process where we've all learned along the way to share the responsibilities that are in front of us as it relates to the, pro the problems, the solutions, and how we collaboratively address them. Uh, I've been watching this, uh, not from the sideline, but our teams have been intimately involved in these conversations. You know, for us, uh, I can uh, tell you that the supervisor who uh, represented this seat that we're currently in, you know, started championing these issues uh, in Imperial County and in River Eastern Riverside County um, and became a strong advocate and a strong voice uh, on these issues. For example, in the uh, communities on the border where we were dealing with uh, sewage water coming into California from the other side of the border, uh, strategizing with the community folks as well as with folks on the other side of the border to come up with a plan. And that plan today is being implemented thanks to the supervisor's work out there, the New River Plan that had been a 50, 60 year environmental justice issue impacting the communities of the border in Calexico and Imperial County. And so it's those types of issues that really motivate us to push for this agenda, but it can't be done on our own. We need to collaborate and coordinate with the appropriate agencies. And I see, I see movement from the agencies to understand the communities uh, out you know, rage and frustration over the course of many years where a lot of these issues feel like they've not been attended to, but we see some progress. We see some progress and we ultimately see that there is a will on behalf of the agencies and the community uh, that we are serving to see the end results, which are improving the quality of health in our region. You know, my background, I come from local government, but before that I was working in education and uh, always important uh, for me to be engaged directly and allow for people to come up with their own solutions to the problems that they face every single day. And uh, as a policymaker, that is a very similar approach that we take. I had the fortunate pleasure, as mentioned earlier, to work for the supervisor for Senator Wessel and now Congressman Vargas and was able to learn from the different styles of leadership and how they went about collaborating and coordinating with folks and been very fortunate uh, to use those types of strategies to be able to move our agenda here in Sacramento forward on behalf of the people that we get to represent. Uh, I just wanna say thank you again for the invitation. I uh, appreciate you thinking of us as you're putting together your agenda and know that we'll always be a champion for these issues, uh, not just for our district, but for the entire state of California. Take care everyone and look forward to seeing you all when we get home. Well, thank you, Assemblyman Member Eduardo Garcia, for those uh, very important words. Um, I also wanted to, as we've been thanking our, our uh, various speakers and panelists throughout the evening, I wanted to also give another uh, a thanks to uh, a big thanks to Dr. Jalone White Newsom, who came in from all the way from Washington, D.C. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. From the White House, the White House. How about that? Thank you so much. We appreciate that. Um, not as important as that are those centerpieces. I know you're thinking about those. Somebody gets to take those home. Um, we uh, do not encourage violence, but if your birthday is the closest to today's date, then you get the centerpiece, unless somebody generous at the table wants to see, we have some winners already. So, and no wrestling. So that was good. That was very good. We appreciate that. So we are, we are left uh, inspired to seize the moment and uh, continue to advocate for our community. So on behalf of South Coast AQMD, I extend our heartfelt thanks for your participation in the ninth Annual Environmental Justice Conference. It is our sincere hope that you've found this conference enriching and that you were able to forge new connections and strengthen existing ones. As you've heard today from all of our wonderful speakers, the time to act is now. And the journey toward a future with clean air still has a long way to go, as everyone knows. Meeting our goals is, is going to require some a cross sec, a sector of collaboration between state, federal, and local government, as well as the private sector, and of course you. Each of us plays a role in initiating change, and it might start with a simple act such as choosing to walk, 
bike or share a ride instead of driving. Or maybe it involves more significant commitment like joining a community organization that advocates for systemic change to clean our air. Every step, no matter how small counts, South Coast Aid Community offers resources such as the Do One Thing videos, which you can, uh, which provide actionable insights on how you can contribute to this cause. Uh, our two dynamic educational programs, which we hope you will check out, the Clean Air Program for Elementary Students, CAPES, and the Why Healthy Air Matters uh, Program, WAM, are also available to help teachers and students in uh, the region learn more about air quality and how to become clean air heroes. To learn more about both programs, you can visit uh, our website at aqmd.gov. We offer a free award-winning mobile app that lets you monitor local air quality. You can receive air quality alerts and more. And we encourage you to use these tools regularly uh, and often to, uh, to ensure the uh, well-being of your loved ones and the wider community. The app is available on Apple Store and Google Play. So uh, we invite you to stay connected with South Coast AQMD. You can also do that on the social media platforms. Maybe you've heard of them, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and X, formerly known as Twitter, at South Coast AQMD. Today's uh, conference owes its success to our dedicated team committed to serving our communities, our MC, Leticia Juarez, and all of our wonderful speakers. Their dedication and inspirational messages have made this event meaningful, sparking action toward a cleaner future. And as our program comes to an end, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today, both in person and for those of you who are with us remotely. Thank you again uh, to the staff that made this event possible, as well as all the speakers and panelists and moderators. And I hope you enjoyed the event that, uh, that you were able to connect with one another. We have confidence that uh, uh, you are departing with a deeper understanding of the challenges ahead. And before you leave, we, uh, we uh, ask you to please take a moment to fill out a short survey so that we can ensure that we make this event even better next year. And you're also invited to use these final few minutes to connect with anyone that you may have met here today, because uh, as we've seen, stronger coalitions bring forward greater positive change. Again, thank you all uh, for participating. On behalf of South Coast AQMD and the Environmental Justice Community Partnership Program, thank you for spending this time with us, and we hope you'll stay engaged to join us in the fight for environmental justice. This concludes our conference, and thank you all for coming.